If shooting smaller groups is your desire, then running a jump test or a seating depth test may be the most effective way of shrinking your groups. In this video, I'm going to review this step of the load development process, show how we got here, and go over the data from today's testing. When it comes to seating depth testing, if you want to call it jump testing, cartridge overall length testing, there are several procedures that everyone uses to come up with the best groups that they can. However, the one I've been testing here recently on the channel was put forth by Eric Cortina and is Chasing the Lands is Stupid video. I have already demonstrated this process on the 140 grain ELDM by Hornady with what I feel is some reasonable success. Being able to achieve successive groups at 0.413 and 0.385 MOA with our previous test improvement versus the 0.6 MOA groups that we were shooting, I feel that that was a success. Those results were so good, I wanted to try this procedure on a projectile that's performance that, frankly, wasn't very good. And just see how much we could actually improve it. Today we are switching it up and using a projectile that, rather frankly, I haven't been too impressed with. The 143 grain ELDX by Hornady. In previous testing I've done on the channel with this projectile, I've had people reach out and tell me how good their results have been. But frankly, at least for me, I haven't seen it. Most 5-shot groups have been well over an MOA, and if you're happy with that, you're not going to hurt my feelings, but it's not what I'm looking for for performance. To make sure we're all on the same page, I'm going to quickly review this process, how it works, and show you exactly what I did and the results that I was able to achieve. I don't want to rehash Eric's whole video for you, but in short, he discusses how to find an accuracy node and make sure you stay in that node. It's certainly a good watch if you haven't seen it, and if you haven't, I encourage you to do so. What some people seem to struggle with this process is that Eric does not discuss this tuning process in relation to the lands or how far the projectile is actually jumping to the lands. He doesn't care. All too often, and I've been guilty of this as well, talking about cartridge overall length in terms of jump and how far the lands are away. One of his main points, as I understand it, is that as your barrel wears in, you do not want to keep changing your coal based on that measurement unless your groups tell you you need to do so. This involves not actually monitoring the lands, but more of the groups that you're actually getting. And that performance will tell you if a cartridge over a length change is needed. If you don't want the crib notes version of this test, I'll encourage you to watch the playlist that I'm going to link at the end of the video. You maybe even want to watch some of those videos more than once, but the quick summary of Eric's test method, or at least my best interpretation of it, is these four steps. The first is finding your jam point on your projectile. Number two, testing powder and primer all at the same time to find a good velocity node. Step three is loading three shot groups, decreasing the cartridge overall length in three thousandths increments. In step number four, we're actually shooting the groups and looking for those accurate nodes where we have consecutive small groups, not just one small group surrounded by bigger groups around it. Today's video is going to cover essentially steps three and four together, but if you'd like to see videos on all these steps, again, I'm going to link that playlist at the end of the video. To figure out where we got here, let's review our results real quick. So when starting this process, you need to have a couple things figured out, or at least a real good idea before you start. The first is the neck tension, as this is going to affect our jam dimension. The neck tension we're going to use for today's testing, I'm going to call two thousandths, but it was generated by full length sizing and opening up the case neck with a .262 mandrel to set that final neck dimension. I have a whole video on finding jam that's going to be in that playlist. In that video, you'll find with these 143 grain ELDX, I just couldn't get a reliable measurement with that neck tension, so I backed it off a little bit. The test platform for using to test today is a Ruger Precision Rifle Chamberlain 6.5 Creedmoor. It has a 26 inch white oak precision barrel. The dimensions that I was able to measure I'll put on your screen, and you can see that basically contact is going to be at a CBTO of about 2.227 inches, which is going to translate to a cartridge overall length of about 2.876. But as you increase neck tension, you can insert that projectile a little bit further in the lands without it sticking. We're going to take our jam CBTO from our 2.635 expander mandrel setting. The CBTO of 2.255 is what we're going to use. Eric typically recommends backing off jam by 20 thousandths, but knowing we have more neck tension, I'm only going to back it off 15. It's probably safer to go even more. Either way, our starting CBTO for today's testing is going to be 2.240 inches and we're going to decrease that number in three thousandths increments as we shoot three shot groups. I know some of you aren't going to be a fan of three shot groups and that's fine. My strategy on this has always been you can't tell if a group is specifically going to be good with a three shot group, but you can certainly tell if it's going to be bad. At least for me, I've never seen a group get any smaller the more rounds that were fired into it. That aside, we're going to go back and verify this after we've determined our optimum value, which we will be doing for today's video. 
If this all seems complicated, you can simply pick a value you know that the projectile isn't even contacting lands, possibly magazine length, and use this number as your starting point. I was just trying to go through this example as completely as possible. After we got our jam measurement, we went to our powder and primer. We ran the test that I'll put on your screen now, and you can see that we used Reloader 16 with the CCI 41 and the Fed 205 Match AR. When picking a charge weight to use out of our chart, we were looking for the widest node available. Looking at 42.6 grains on our Fed 205 Match AR, we can see we appear to be right in the middle of a velocity node at 2882 feet per second, and that is a number that we're going to use for a day's testing. Something that's not necessarily part of Eric's recommendation is verifying that load before we go into the overall length test. This is an extra step that I've added. Keep in mind these are guidelines. You have to do what's comfortable for your reloading process. So before we went too deep down this rabbit hole, I wanted to make sure 42.6 grains of reloader 16 over a different cartridge over length was still going to perform well. So our first test at that 2.240 inch has a cartridge overall length of 2.888. And another one we ran at essentially what's magazine length for me of 2.820 inches. I chronographed both of these groups to see what the velocity looked like. I didn't get a picture of the groups, but I do have the velocity numbers, which was what we were interested in. Our longest cartridge overall length with a CBTO of 2.240 inches yield us an average velocity of 2888 feet per second, an extreme spread of 19, and a standard deviation of 7.4 over 5 rounds sampled. I tested seven rounds at that shorter length of 2.820 inches. That, our velocity dropped to 2868 feet per second, but our good standard deviations and extreme spreads were preserved because our SD was only five and our extreme spread was only 14. So we did lose about 20 feet per second with the change in cartridge overall length, but the statistics are better and we had a slightly larger sample size. It's clear to me at this point that this load should produce some acceptable standard deviations and so this is why we move forward with today's test. So getting into our exact load details for today, we're using three times fired lapo of brass, annealed, full length size, the neck diameter is set with a 0.262 inch expander mandrel made by 21st Century Reloading. Fed 205 Match AR, again 42.6 grains of Alliance Reloader 16, starting off with that longest CBTO of 2.240 inches, we're going to go all the way down to 2.183 inches in 3,000 steps. There is quite a few groups to go over for today's test, so let's just get right to it. Starting our CBTO of 2.240 inches, we started off the day with a 0.663 MOA group. Going down 3 thousandths, 0.505 MOA. 2.234, 0 0.401 MOA. Keeping in mind, we're approaching that 2.227 inch CBTO where we're having touch here, so I think our next group, our three shot group, we jumped up to 1.303 MOA. And largely, I think that increase is due to some of the projectiles just starting in and out of the lands. But we're going to talk more about that towards the end of the video. At 2.228 inches, we dropped back down to 0.457 MOA. At a CBTO of 2.225 inches, we went up to 0.646 MOA. 2.222, we went to 0.808 MOA. At 2.219, we went 0.601 MOA. At 2.216, 0.957 MOA. At 2.213, we went to 1.218 MOA. At 2.21, we dropped back down slightly to 0.922 MOA. At 2.207, we dropped down to 0.666. 2.204 was 0.95. At 2.201, 0.65 MOA. At 2.198, 0.841 MOA. At 2.195, 0.699 MOA. At 2.192, 0.701 MOA. 2.189, 0.646 MOA. 2.186.535 MOA, and then for our last group at 2.183, we jumped up to 0.815 MOA. Keep in mind, again, these are all three shot groups, and the more samples we test, they're not gonna get any smaller. I'm sure some of you would prefer to have the chart, but then some people were gonna wanna see the group so you guys could get everything. If you skipped and went straight to the charts, here we go. Now our first chart here is in CBTO. I know some people wanted to see the charts in cartridge overall length or possibly in jump, so I'm going to include those. Feel free to pause the video at any time and you guys can see those. It's the same MOA graph, essentially just on a different axis, translated to either jump or cartridge overall length. Typically what we would do here is find where we had very small consecutive groups, and essentially the smallest consecutive groups I picked right down at the end, basically where we started from. I did take some extra rounds to the range this day so I could adjust their cartridge overall length at the range and move on to the next step of this test. 
Keep in mind, I actually initially stopped at that 2.198 CBTO. If you looked only at that section of the graph, we can see I didn't have very many consecutive small groups to choose from. I loaded at a CBTO of 2.236, and at four shots, I already found that my group had opened up to 1.024 MOA, so that is where I stopped because I didn't want to waste any rounds. I spent the remainder of the remaining rounds that I had loaded shrinking in 3,000 increments, hoping we were going to find that smaller group as we went along. And we can see at that CBTO of 2.186, 0.535 MOA, not too bad, surrounded by smaller-ish groups, but again, not really the level of accuracy I was hoping for. I was really hoping to get something closer to the performance of the 140 grain ELDs that I've had so much luck with. But we've still got a lot more to talk about. One of the biggest concerns that people expressed during the last video on the 140 grain ELDs was how the velocity and statistics were affected as we changed the cartridge overall length, feeling that the work we'd done to determine our powder and primer charge might be invalidated as we changed the cartridge overall length. And we have that information for today's video. I actually did a separate video covering this in more detail, but we're going to touch on it just so you guys can see it. During that video we generated the graph you can see on your screen, our average velocity decreased, starting off very close to around that 2900 feet per second range with our longest rounds, going all the way down in velocity our shortest rounds to that around 2866 feet per second, which was almost identical velocity to the magazine length units that we tested before we ran today's test. After I showed the initial velocity chart, I wanted to add the extreme spread data. You can see around that point where the projectile is just getting in and out of the lands, we had that higher extreme spread of 20, which really isn't too crazy to be honest, but well below that for all of the rest of the other testing. Saying that that was extreme spread just didn't sink in because I had quite a few comments on that video that people were confused thinking that was a standard deviation. If you wanted to see the chart with standard deviation on it, I'll throw it up here real quick. The worst standard deviation we had was 10, but overall our standard deviations were somewhere in the ballpark of around 6. Overall, pretty acceptable in my opinion, but let's translate this information over to the group data. Now we take our same cartridge overall length chart that we looked at earlier, post our extreme spreads on there. We can see that our higher extreme spread matched up with our largest group. Again, noting an area in the chart we probably want to avoid with any further load development. Overall, we don't see any bad velocity information that would cause us concern with our group data. Overall, as far as statistics are concerned, I'm pretty pleased. If you'd like to see the plot with standard deviation on it, here you go. Keeping in mind we only tested a range of about 60 thousandths in total cartridge overall length variation, maybe testing a little bit further down the line would yield some more interesting results. When it comes to doing low development, I've always been a fan of finding something that works and then fine tuning that, rather than trying to get performance out of certain projectiles that just aren't really there. Maybe we just haven't found a super wide accuracy node, or do our projectiles just not perform? I don't want to sound like I'm making excuses here, but I'm always looking for ways to understand exactly what problem I'm up against. Why do the 140s fly so much better? If I could have found some on the shelf somewhere, I actually would have picked up another box just to be able to have that data. Maybe I just don't have a very good lot. And if any of you guys have some of these on the shelf, I would love to hear your results in the comments section below. But I pulled out some of my new tools and I started doing some measuring. So the data I'm about to show you was sampled from 40 of the 143 grain ELDXs left from the box that we used to perform this test, and 20 of the 140 grain ELDMs that we'd done from our previous test. Looking at the 140 grain ELDMs, the average weight on those was 139.9 grains, so pretty darn close to their average 140. The average base to ogive measurement was 0.6718, and our average projectile width was 0.6398. Our base to ogive measures were taken with my Mitotoyo caliper and my short action custom projectile comparator. That comparator insert is action machined to the same dimensions as your chamber should be. The values that we're going to look at here should be more valuable from that aspect. I did not redo them with my Hornady tool to see how they compared, but there is a difference. The projectile diameter is being measured with my Mitotoyo micrometers, and in case you're wondering, the accuracy on those is to 405. And the extreme spread for our 140 grain ELDs was exactly that. Basically, they're as tight as this tool can measure inside its own accuracy range. But that's still, in my opinion, pretty impressive. For those of you that are wondering about the weights and how they were measured, they were measured on my FX120i. This can resolve down to 0.02 grains. The average weight on the 143 grain ELDXs was 143.67. Average base to ogive was 0.7. And the projectile width was slightly larger on average than the 140 grain ELDMs. It's really hard 
to resolve that small of a value in your measurement. So take that data with a grain of salt. It's as good as I can measure. What's more interesting, we look at the standard deviation extreme spread in those. The weight really isn't what I find is interesting. There is a slightly larger extreme spread on the weights for the 143 grain ELDXs. The extreme spread on the base to OGI measures for the 140s, these are so consistent that they're within the error in my Mitotoyo calipers. But those measurements were very, very consistent. Looking at the 143 grain ELDXs, the extreme spread of those 40 samples was three and a half thousandths, significantly more than the 140 grain ELDMs. Well, I don't think overall this information is completely damning. I don't know, again, if this is indicative of possibly a bad lot of projectiles. Was I just really lucky with my lot of 140 grain ELDMs? I've shot through several lots of those 140s, and they've been very consistent performers for me. But again, I'd love to know your experience in the comment section below if you're willing to take the time. Now, overall, we went back and sampled. We did have the one four-shot group that was just over an MOA. The other group data that I had was from the remaining units that I had loaded up for hunting this year. CBTO of 2.170 inches, so shorter than we tested all today, but again, those are magazine length. And the five shot group I was able to attain with them was just over an MOA. So I do think altering that overall length, we were able to get a slight improvement or our original baseline. It just wasn't as much of an improvement as I would like to see. And I'm still hopeful that there's more. I wonder if it's possible we just haven't found as forgiving of a node. And with that excessive extreme spread on the base to ogive measurements on these projectiles, we just aren't able to get as consistent of groups as we would like. Overall, I've always cautioned and will continue to, working with projectiles that just don't seem to work very well out of the box. Not saying you can't get them anywhere, but it's certainly easier to tune something that's working well to begin with. But as always, I'm interested in your feedback. What do you guys think of this process? If you've tried it, what were your results, good or bad? Would you like to see some more overall length tuning loose projectiles? Should we keep going with it? Or should we work on something else? I'm interested to know what you guys think in the comments below. If you'd like to see this entire series from start to finish, all the results, all the testing that we've done on it, check out this playlist. It'll walk through you through all the testing, all the measurements we had to do. I hope to see you guys come back next week. And until then, stay safe in small groups.